So thank you for joining us again. Um, we have participants. We've just reached a hundred hundred number, so uh, we'll we'll proceed. Um, my name is Tom Lonergan. I'm the education officer with um, IPSC. The other guy you can see on the screen there is Brian. Do you want to introduce yourself, Brian? Yes, indeed. Brian Allegra, the media officer of the IPSC, and I've been involved for 10 years. It's a fantastic organization. And I have to say that I am flabbergasted by the amount of stuff happening around the country. Uh, one example being all of you here tonight. So fair play to you. Very welcome. And I have to say like that every time, let's say we're in Doyle's pub catching up for a few points after a national demo, just hearing about all the stuff happening within the IPSC that I didn't even know about until then, it's just very, uh, a very inspiring thing to be part of. So welcome tonight. And, you know, looking forward to the, the questions and so forth. Okay. So we also have uh, one of our IPSC colleagues on the call, Donal Holland, and Donal is uh, going to be keeping an eye on the housekeeping and on the questions and answers and stuff like that. And uh, is not on the screen, but is working in the background to ho hopefully uh, ensure we have a successful uh, session tonight. So, as I said, my name is Tom Lonergan. I'm the uh, will be presenting with Brian uh, this evening. Uh, the idea, first of all, for these five sessions came from uh, Palestinian activists themselves uh, that I would met at various places, uh, both the email through like contacted me via email and met on the demos and stuff like that. And uh, the idea was basically people were saying, could could IPSC organize a couple of online sessions? And then we had a chat about it. And uh, so we, we came up with the with these sessions here. The, this first one is kind of a, a little, I guess, introduction to a, a number of aspects, and that'll become a little more clear as we go forward. The second uh, night uh, is is on the history of Palestine, presented by a history teacher, Conal Leduffig, uh, who is involved with Teachers for Palestine. On the third evening, we have a Palestinian. You may have, uh, if you've been on the national demos, you will have come uh, seen her speak or heard her speak. Walla Ajawi, uh, living in Ireland, but obviously has her heritage and her grandfather was expelled in 1948. And uh, we're, we're delighted to have Walla, Walla jo joining us. We to discuss international law, which is very much in the in the news at the moment. We have uh, uh, John Reynolds, Associate Professor of Law in Maynooth. And John is an ex is an expert in Palestine and also an excellent speaker. So we're delighted to have him. And on the final evening, then uh, we'll have Zoe Lawler, our chair, and Brian to wrap up and uh, to, uh, you know, maybe a call to action, see where we go from here, et cetera. Et cetera. Also, I, there's a possibility that we're like, we're very open to your input on these sessions. Uh, if you, if and, and feel free to contact me directly on education at ipsc.ie to send in a question, I guess by email is, is a good way to do it so we can we can capture it. Obviously you'll have questions, we'll have a Q&A session during this session. I just wanna say a couple of things about this webinar. It's a Zoom webinar. We're gonna present for about 40 minutes and then we're gonna have Q&A. The web webinar is being recorded, uh, but attendee details as you can see are just Brian and myself uh, on the screen. So there's no GDPR issues as far as we can see. Uh, live questions can be submitted by using the Zoom Q&A button. You'll see it there with the question mark on the bottom of your, of your screen. You've just got four little buttons there. The chat we've disabled because there's a lot of people on the call and we just, it, it would uh, be a little bit too too difficult to manage, I think. Um, and responses will be either uh, verbally from Brian and myself or by text from Donal or Brian or myself, okay? Uh, we may do a, a short poll as well if we have time. It's a very simple poll, and I think we'll we'll crack on. Am I forgetting anything, Brian? I don't think so. Remind uh, remind people how many people on the call? Ninety, you said. Uh, one hundred one hundred and thirty. Wow, that's absolutely brilliant. Okay, Perfect. so yeah, that's really impressive. Thank you, and thank you so much for coming. Right, um, now, why is it so important that we talk about Palestine? Now, we've got a good bit to cover tonight. So these are just a couple of points that I jot, jotted down and, and uh, earlier when we were preparing for this webinar. And I'll just go through them. I'll, I'm just going to actually read them, right? So what's happening in Palestine has become the defining issue of our time, right? 
there's so many things wrapped up in there's so many aspects of of of, of the issue with Palestine. So we've gone from Zionism to settler colonialism, ethnic cleansing, occupation, apartheid, famine, and now genocide. Israel is being run by the their government is the most ultra right extremist slash religious terrorist government in its history, and it's had you know some pretty bad governments, but this is the worst in my view, right? Somebody. Uh, a full-scale genocide is taking place in Gaza, and this is happening in full view of the world. And in my estimation, this is the first time that this has ever happened, right? We've had geno genocides before, but not in real time. Not where the the, the world can see what is, what is happening. And that is that is that is just shocking. Um there's strategic targeting of Palestinian hospitals, universities, schools, media communications, aid agencies, cultural institutes, including all the staff, the medical staff, the doctors, the nurses, all the care staff, the professors, the lecturers, the teachers, the reporters, so many of, of who've been killed, and aid workers. And that's only that's only to name some of them. The political leaders of the most powerful Western democracies are supporting this genocide. And this has the implications for human, civil, and political rights, for morality, how we see morality, and social justice, not just in Palestine, in the Middle East, but everywhere. A few more points. The rules, norms, and standards of international law are being attacked and undermined. Mainstream Western media fails to report the facts, spreads Israeli lies verbatim in many cases, and is complicit as a result in this genocide. The implications for the United Nations, the various UN bodies, the U Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is, you know, we, we all uh, kind of see as, as, as you know, under, underlying the, the human values that, are, that, that people and the human rights that people are supposed to have is being undermined massively. There's a double standards are being applied in relation to Palestine by the West. And we can see that, for example, in how Palestine is treated compared to, for example, Ukraine. But that's just one example. Normalization of barbarism by Israel is happening. And Israel is not a normal state. Impunity from legal prosecution within Israel for the Israeli occupation forces, the extremists, including settlers in the West Bank, and impunity for Israel by the Western democracies. Here are some statements from leaders at various points. David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of, of, of Israel in 1948, he said, with compulsory transfer, we have a vast area. And the vast area he's talking about the, the various uh, areas outside of Palestine. I support compulsory transfer. I don't see anything immoral in it. Golda Meir, I think she was the fourth uh, Prime Minister of, of Israel, she said, there is no such thing as the Palestinian people. It's not as if we can, came and threw them out and took their country. They didn't exist. Israeli Deputy Defence Minister in 2013, Rabbi Eli Ben Dahan, Palestinians are beasts. They are not human. Israeli Minister of Justice in 2014, they should go as should the physical homes in which they raised the snakes. Otherwise, more little snakes will be raised there. Pure racism. And Israeli Defense Minister in 2015, those who are against us, there's nothing to be done. We need to pick up an ax and cut off his head. These are ministers, leaders in Israeli government who have made these statements openly. I'll let you judge those statements for yourself. So many of us have seen this map uh, and, and what it reflects in terms of colonization, 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 ethnic cleansing and genocide from pre-1947, where Palestinians were still in control of the vast majority of the, of the land to the partition plan in 1948, or sorry, 47, where the, where, uh, uh, Palestine was partitioned against its wishes in 19, 
to, to 1967 and to today, to the present day. And we'll be talking about this a little bit more in some of the sessions. Uh, Connell is going to cover it uh, next week as well. So I won't spend much time on this because Brian has some slides on it as well. But is is Israel is guilty of apartheid and by three of the main human rights bodies in the world. Uh, first of all, uh, Bet Salem, which is uh, the foremost Israeli information center for human rights in January of 2021, followed by a report from Human Rights Watch in April 2021, and uh, followed again in February 2022 by Amnesty International. The reality of apartheid, uh, integrating Jews, separating Palestinians. This is from the Human Rights Watch report uh, from 2021. Uh, 6, 6 6.8 million Jews, is, Israelis, free to live wherever they want in, in, in Israel, East Jerusalem, or most of the West Bank. And 6.8 uh, Palestinians, uh, citizens of Israel, in the occupied territories, in the West Bank, or, Ga or in Gaza, with, with diminished uh, rights uh, and, you know, absolutely, you know, to, to, to show the reality of apartheid. This was, I just want to show this because in is Israel's uh, uh, statements, they're in, in Gaza to uh, eradicate Hamas, right? That's what they're saying. Yet they have obliterated the history, the cultural history of Gaza in the process. Over 195 sites of historical importance have been destroyed or damaged by Israeli bombing since October 7th, including an ancient harbor dating back to 800 BC, a mosque from 1277 AD, which that was the home of rare manuscripts, and one of the world's oldest Christian monasteries in 340 AD. I mean, this shows just the sheer systematic uh, genocide, cultural side, edu side, that Israel is, you know, has has gone about in a targeted fashion. I just want to show a short film. It's about four and a half minutes long, and then I'll come back to you. Every June, Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, mark another year of living under Israel's brutal military occupation, now more than a half century old. This occupation is characterized by the violent theft of Palestinian land and resources, racial profiling and targeting of civilians, mass incarceration and torture, and more. For decades, a supposed peace process has been ongoing to end this occupation, but instead it has served as a cover for Israel as it further entrenches its control over Palestinians and their land. The occupation and settlement of the West Bank and Gaza were never meant to be temporary. They are simply the latest iteration of Zionism, the settler colonial project being carried forward by the State of Israel. The Zionist movement that would come to found Israel sought to respond to European anti-Semitism by creating a Jewish nation-state in Palestine. Zionist leaders understood that a way to manufacture a Jewish majority was to remove the native Palestinian inhabitants and settle Jewish people in their place. Despite anti-Zionist campaigning by Palestinian leaders, the Zionist movement won support from Britain with the Balfour Declaration in 1917, triggering decades of fierce Palestinian resistance to the colonization of their homeland. This included international lobbying for independence from the British Empire and, in 1936, a massive popular mobilization that began as a general strike and would eventually become the armed uprising known as the Arab Revolt. Despite Palestinian resistance, in 1947 the UN recommended partitioning Palestine against the will of its native Palestinian population and Zionist militias were emboldened to create a state by force, including through the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. In order to create the State of Israel with a Jewish majority on 78% of Palestine, Zionist forces depopulated and destroyed 500 Palestinian villages, 
and then denied 750,000 Palestinian refugees the right to return to their homes after the war ended. Today, more than 7 million Palestinian refugees live in exile, prevented from exercising their inalienable right to return to their homes simply because they are not Jewish. Meanwhile, Israeli law permits Jewish people from around the world to immigrate to that same land anytime they wish. Although they were eventually granted citizenship, Palestinians who remained in what became Israel lived under martial law and military rule for nearly two decades. Today, Palestinian citizens of Israel remain subject to a system built to structurally disadvantage them. With more than 50 laws that discriminate against them as non-Jews in a Jewish state. Israel's intentions are most clear when it comes to the Gaza Strip, where Palestinians are targeted by a suffocating siege, denied their basic needs for survival, including adequate food, clean water, and electricity, subjected to periodic heavy bombardment, and sealed off from the world, unable to escape. This is a humanitarian catastrophe, deliberately manufactured and maintained by Israel. U.S. taxpayers are complicit in Israel's apartheid system through the billions of dollars in weapons that the U.S. gives Israel each year, about $10 million every day, and through the political and diplomatic support the U.S. provides in blocking international efforts to hold Israel accountable. After more than 100 years of Palestinian resistance to Zionist colonization, it is as urgent as ever to join the movement for freedom, justice, and equality for the Palestinian people. So, uh, one of the reasons I like that short film is in four and a half minutes, it summarizes the whole situation and basically says, this is not complicated. Uh, this is a land grab by one group of people, the Zionist project uh, over a land which was populated by the Palestinian people for centuries. Um, so um, many commentators will say this is such a complex situation that uh, we, it cannot, you know, ordinary people it uh, cannot understand it. It's too complex to, to, uh, to explain. It's a they may say on religious or other reasons why it's so complex, etc. Et but it's not. It's a land grab, um, and the Palestinian people are, you know, have been oppressed uh, by the, the Zionist project for over a hundred years. So, in that situation, uh, in response to that, uh, I just want to look at a few signs of hope. Uh, what keeps us all going? What keeps the Palestinians people people going? Uh, and the main one is obviously the resistance of the, Palest that the Palestinian people have shown over the last hundred years to the oppression. They still resist every day in their lives, and we support them in that. The growing pro uh, global pro Palestinian movement throughout the world, including uh, countries in the West, including Ireland, including the US, uh, where public opinion is shifting, especially among younger people. The rise of the student and staff resistance in university campuses has been, uh, you know, very, very um, excellent, uh, uh, you know, in, in its response uh, and very brave in its response. And uh, obviously we've seen uh, excellent uh, protests here as well in our own universities in Ireland, and hopefully that will, will spread. Uh, obviously, we've got the precedent of the downfall of the apartheid regime in South Africa. So that was ended, and the apartheid regime in, in Israel will also end. And one of the main reasons that it will end is because of the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, that growing movement, uh, which is so important, boycott by individuals, divestment uh, of, of uh, by companies or of companies, etc., in terms of their their investment in Israel and sanctions by government, which we've seen very little of, but we need to see more of it and we need to keep pushing for that. The recent and unprecedented uh, uh, international law cases against Israel at the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court are, are really positive to see in terms of uh, uh, Palestine. And hopefully, uh, we even though they're taking, they will take a long time, they're 
uh, Israel is not happy that it's in the dock in relation to these these cases. There's also a decline, I think, in terms of the the the, the mainstream nar narrative coming, the Israeli narrative being, uh, you know, pushed through ma mainstream me media, and uh, social media is giving us, you know, has given and will continue to give alternative channels where we can see what's really happening on the ground. Uh, increasing support for Palestine from a range of Jewish groups, uh, uh, Jewish Voice for Peace, etc., uh, and many many other groups, and this is really. Uh, you know, very heartening to see as well. Israel itself, uh, within within Israel, Israel um, often gives the impression, uh, tries to project an image of unity, as etc., uh, to the world. You know, a, a unified state, but there are deep divisions within Israel, and there are cracks, major cracks, beginning to emerge. Uh, Ilan Pape would would uh, Israeli historian would certainly. Um, uh, uh, say say that and and he's correct so there's very extremist uh religious groups secular groups etc and they're not even though they they're all in favor of the current uh war against hamas etc there are many divisions within those groups uh israel is struggling to control the internal in its internal media it has a it has very strong sense censorship uh among all its media channels and the most recent example of that was its banning of Al Jazeera in within Israel. So only just a couple of weeks ago, um, and that's showing the pressure Israel is under to hold things together. Uh, and what we want to see is increasing uh, isolation of Israel internationally through boycott, divest, and sanctions, especially sanctions. And and I think that is beginning beginning to happen as well. Okay, I've just got a couple of final slides, um, mainly uh, around what kind of resources, what kind of information, what kind of uh, books, resources, links, uh, videos, etc., are available that that are very good on on Palestine. If people are interested in in these, Brian is going to talk about uh, this a little bit as well. Uh, a couple of ones which I think are really worth recommending are Elaine Pape, uh, the Israeli historian. Um, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Uh, it's an excellent. Uh, it, it's focusing on 1948 and what happened in in, in 1948 and 47, 48, 49, etc. Cetera, et cetera, uh, with the expulsion of um, and ki killing of a lot of murder of a lot of Palestinians, uh, an expulsion of 750,000 Palestinians. So that's an excellent one. Uh, similar, uh, all excellent one is uh, the Hundred Years War on Palestine by Rashid Khalidi, a Palestinian. Um, uh, excellent, uh, again, uh, 10 Myths About Palestine by Ilan Pape, um, Gideon Levy, who still, who still writes in Haaretz, uh, newspaper in Israel, uh, is, is actually, you know, excellent as well in terms of his, uh, his articles, his, his books, etc. etc. And, uh, Ali Abu Nima, who is a Palestinian uh, based in uh, the US, but uh, very much in touch with, with the everyday situation in Palestine. I wrote this book, uh, The Battle for Justice in Palestine. Uh, he's also involved in, this is the website he started, the Electronic Intifada. It's been going for about 20 years. It's an amazing uh, uh, website in terms of the detail. Uh, it's the articles are written by Palestinian uh, journalists on the ground in Gaza, in the West Bank, many of them who have been murdered. Uh, and uh, uh, it's just an amazing, uh, absolute, uh, uh, you know, brilliant uh, uh, resource for anyone who wants to to uh, keep up to date with Palestine. And the final one. Uh, is, is just a final slide here is just uh, a number of different resources, everything from visualizing Palestine gives the website links there. We'll share these also after the meeting. Um, excellent websites, Middle East Monitor, Mondo Weiss, the Palestine Chronicle, uh, Palestine Campaign. Um, and the reason we're giving these kind of resources or recommending these resources is there's an awful lot of resources. There's an awful lot of links videos is uh, etc on the on the on the on the web that are quite confusing that will give multiple histories of palestine which will probably 
uh, confuse a lot of people and and therefore you know it's very important that that pro palestinian activists have access to solid well founded uh, fact based resources uh, and and uh, we also mentioned here al jazeera which is excellent bds uh, uh, if you if you want to if you want to uh, link in and just see uh, two massacres that happened in 1948 one is a uh, a village uh, outside of jerusalem called der yassin uh, which was uh, you know, which you can read read about a massive, uh, you know, horrendous massacre of Palestinians, and another uh, one called Tantura in North Israel, uh, North current Israel was Northern Palestine, obviously. Um, as a recent film uh, based on that, and there are some links to it. Uh, we are not numbers is a is an excellent website, Palis a more recent website. Uh, there's a good debate there, uh, just in that link and the. Uh, uh, the three links that we referred to earlier in terms of apartheid. So I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to hand over to you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Brian O'Meager, the media officer at the IPSC. And the title of my part of the presentation, we need to talk about Palestine. The point being that we need to talk about Palestine. The reason why is because of media bias. The media portray things very much in Israeli terms, and it's up to ordinary people such as ourselves to turn it around. So I'll give you a quick overview of my time with the IPSC. I was always curious about uh, what was going on there. Uh, read books, read newspaper articles, watched documentaries, including five broken cameras. Then in 2014, I knew I had to get stuck in. There was a, a massacre that year, a military onslaught on Gaza, and I plunged into activity with the IPSC, lots of marches, then moving on to doing stalls on a Saturday when things quietened down, uh, talking to the people. Um, I learned graphic design around that time, and I began to design leaflets for the IPSC. And then uh, something I was very much into and had an increasing level of success with was getting published in the papers with a very strong message. And I'm currently learning editing. So the rest of my presentation is going to be about what exactly the print media are doing and what specifically we can do about it. Two recommendations from me, not a book list, but two recommendations. I cannot say this enough. Everyone should tonight order a copy of Israeli Apartheid, A Beginner's Guide by Ben White, unless you already have a copy, order it tonight from Pluto Press. It is a very, a very slim volume. You'll read it in a few days. And by the time you've read it, you will be uh, very confident around a lot of Israeli talking points and what to say in relation to them. A lot of different aspects of Israeli history and the core characteristics of the Israeli state and its apartheid regime against the Palestinian people. Another strong uh, recommendation 10 myths about israel by Ellen pape one of israel's foremost foremost uh historians and uh i recommend that one as well it takes takes them down one after another so focusing on the media first of all rt our national broadcaster what about them the first thing to, that i am saying here is that there are unspoken editorial rules about what footage they will show and what footage they won't We've all seen on social media things like a man lifting rubble uh, out of the smashed remains of his home and uncovering the limp, dust-covered arm of a child. Now, RT won't show that. They will show uh, 12 medics uh, busting in out of, a, out of an ambulance into a hospital and so forth. So there are certain things they will show. There are certain things they won't. Um, but... They do disproportionately platform Israeli military spokespeople, such as uh, the Israeli military's Daniel Hagari. We've seen him lots of times. Lots of times he gets a solid 20 seconds, a solid 30 seconds to speak, unchallenged, reiterating the repeated lies of the Israeli military. Uh, we've had uh, Israeli Ambassador Dana Ehrlich on unchallenged. Now, if they don't have a Palestinian voice, and very often they don't, uh, if they don't have a, a voice from a human rights organization, then that is 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 absolutely deplorable. Um, more problems. 
decontextualization of the current carnage, by which I mean, you would swear that history began on the 7th of October. So um, let's see, what is the context? Well, the context is apartheid and collective punishment. Uh, now this was our flagship leaflet uh, in the days uh, before you know, this carnage began. So it's covering the the issue. The issue basically Israeli apartheid in the West Bank, in Gaza, in the Israeli state itself, um, and it defines apartheid. And it was pushing the Irish government to finally recognise because Michal Martin, Simon Coveney hadn't admitted this. What we're looking at is apartheid, and they needed to, to to accept that and take effective action to stop it. Definition: apartheid, a crime against humanity, according to the International Criminal Court. So where you have an institutionalized regime of systemic oppression and domination of one racial group over another, and where you have inhumane acts committed with the intention of remaining that maintaining that regime, you have apartheid. This is B'Tselem, as Tom said, Israel's foremost human rights organization in 2021. If anyone ever says that it is anti-Semitic to accuse the Israeli state of apartheid, well, you tell them, Israel's foremost human rights organization said very clearly a regime of Jewish supremacy from the River Jordan to the Mediterranean Sea. This is apartheid. Next up was Human Rights Watch, New York based, world renowned human rights organization, released a similar report the same year. Following year, a very big one for us, which was the um, Amnesty International. So uh, we've done a number of collaborative events with Amnesty International. And uh, it was a big thing for us when they said that, you know, uh, moving on now. So media coverage and getting specific on it. And here I am going to go to a. Um, yes, this is a style guide for journalists that we released to a specific media outlet who we had a meeting with. Recommendations for journalists who wish to use language that is in line with international law and international legal consensus. Uh, we believe that the aim of journalism is to promote clear understanding of issues. A reader should be able to read an article and understand the matter from a standing start. Don't just say the West Bank. It should always be introduced as the Israeli-occupied West Bank invaded, illegally occupied since 2000 or since 1967. And similarly, East Jerusalem invaded in 1967, illegally annexed in 1980. The Gaza Strip, similarly under Israeli occupation, external occupation. Golan Heights, the same. Settlements should always be referred to in the media as Israeli settlements, illegal Israeli settlements, settlers, are illegal Israeli settlers. That is their legal status. Um, their, their presence there is a violation of international law. The papers often forget to say this. They talk about Jewish neighborhoods in East Jerusalem. Now, those are illegal settlements, and the papers have to be honest about this. Um, finally, uh, in this style guide, referring to Palestinians as gunmen, so it's a term that has very negative connotations. It's a, a coded word in the media. It's been used many times in, in Irish history, obviously. It tells you here, a search of the Irish Times website shows 2,000 word, two thousand uses of the phrases Palestinian gunmen or gunman, and only two results for Israeli gunmen or gunman. So we're saying, tell it like it is, bit of fairness, Bit of objectivity, please. Now, back to the uh, next slide of the presentation. So, now, over the last eight months, the media rarely mention that 75% of the population of Gaza are already refugees driven from their home in 1948 uh, in the ethnic cleansing that launched the State of Israel. That is why there are 2.3 million people in Gaza, because they're crammed in there. 
very little contextualization of the ongoing Nakba, that this is something that has been happening relentlessly. This is the foundation of Israel was in 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 based on ethnic cleansing, and there is that ethnic cleansing that continues, that the Israeli state is expansionist, that Israeli politicians claim Gaza as part of the Israeli state, claim the West Bank as part of the Israeli state. Violence by occupation forces and settlers in West Bank, in the West Bank, illegal settlers, I should say, in the West Bank, they, uh, 420 Palestinians uh, have been reported by the UN now, I don't know how accurate that is, but by the UN, 420 Palestinians over the last uh, year, or sorry, over the last eight months. So that's an outrage in itself. There's very little coverage of that. And this is in an area where Hamas is not militarily organized. Context, no contextualization of Palestinian political prisoners. So when they talk about hostage deals and hostage swaps, they barely acknowledge that lots of the Palestinian political prisoners are not even charged or tried with anything. And so on. Israeli defense forces, we can all see the problem with that particular term. Uh, Gaza's Hamas-run health ministry, they love that phrase, that's both RTE on an ongoing basis. So what to do about some of these things? Well, here's where we tackled them on the um, on one of those. Listening to RT's Morning Ireland, found something very incongruous about the statement that it's very the defense forces that are now in control of Al-Shifa Hospital. Number of Palestinian fatalities over the past five weeks stands at more than eight times the number of Israeli fatalities. As for Israeli hostages held in the West in the Gaza Strip, I need hardly explain the effect of a massive indiscriminate bombing campaign. On this basis, the current Israeli onslaught is neither a defensive maneuver nor a rescue mission, nor can the Israeli military's actions, even in times of re relative quiet, be characterized as defense. Israeli troops are largely deployed in an illegal expansionist project in the occupied West Bank, where they facilitate what Doyle Aaron has unanimously recognized as de facto annexation, and where they've killed 182 Palestinians over the past few weeks. This was a long time ago now. It's high time our national broadcaster began to question the Israeli state's denomination of its military as the Israel Defense Forces. Another example, again, RTE. I can only imagine eyes rolling across the country as RTE's news bulletins routinely frame reports of catastrophically mounting Palestinian fatalities as coming from the Hamas-run health ministry in Gaza. No such forbidding framing applies to accounts of Israeli fatalities, despite the diabolical track record of Israeli military spokespeople in misattributing, equivocating, and stonewalling around their responsibility for killings of civilians. It's remarkable that our national broadcaster cannot acknowledge the appalling news coming from the Gaza Strip without routinely casting subtle aspersions on the factuality of the wholesale carnage there. Another example. Anatomy of a takedown. So what does that involve? There's an article. It's written perhaps by one of our opponents. Now, we don't like the article. That's not the point. We're going to read it carefully. We're going to find a factual error or a grotesque omission that decontextualizes it, something they are neglecting to mention. We focus on one thing and we explain what the scenario is. In fact, we pull some statistics from a source that the papers are likely to regard as, as acceptable, such as the UN, uh, Israeli Human Rights Organization, B'Tselem, Amnesty International. Uh, a quote, perhaps from one of those organizations, and a strong finish. So I'll go into that now, just a second. So. What we're talking about here, Alan Shatter, how Ireland can help resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. State must support and participate in a Middle East fund to restart peace process. Now, he's talking about Israel, the PLO, the provisional IRA. He's talking about the International Fund for Ireland, blah, blah, blah. For a peace process to succeed, it's essential that people who perceive each other as and blah, blah, blah. Keep reading. We're looking for something that is a glaring factual error, glaring factual omission. Blah, blah, blah. 
Irish government's blame and demonization. So, new international approach. This is where he's getting to his point. Uh, he's basically, what he's doing here is he is putting the, uh, he, he's basically claiming that what is true of the north of Ireland is true of Palestine. Well, that's obviously blatantly false. There's a grotesque uh, power imbalance in the case of uh, the Palestinian situation. As we very well know, the US is no honest broker. There's a number of things to focus on here. So we tackle him. Sir, Alan Shatter's proposal, how Ireland can help resolve the conflict, is hamstrung by his failure to acknowledge the key factor which undermines the viability of the two-state solution, to which Shatter claims there is no viable alternative. Uh, a quote from Michael Link, uh, UN Special Rapporteur, the illegal settlements which continue to devour the land meant for the independent Palestinian state. On this basis, and this is the nub of it, the comparison between the Northern Ireland and the Middle East, which lies at the core of his analysis, is a red herring. It's true, state-sponsored population transfer programs have influenced both regions. Here's the difference. The Ulster Plantation concluded centuries ago the Israeli state's colonization of the West Bank and East Jerusalem continues apace. And crucially, this isn't just uh, illegal settlers. This isn't just Itamar Bankavir and Smotrich. This is mandated in 2018's nation state bill, a basic law of the Israeli state at the very core of the Israeli state that the settlements are a national value, which the Israeli state will labor to encourage and promote. So then we finish strong. Any credible analysis must acknowledge the Israeli state's ongoing illegal settlement project. Any credible international response must tackle it head on. So we basically introduce the matter. We define the problem. We lay bare the, 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 the basis of what he's arguing here. We say that what the problem with it is. And then we have a quote, Michael Link in this case, and then we finish strong. So that's uh, how that works, basically. And uh, we work very collaboratively in the media group. Um, and, you know, long may it continue. Uh, next up, we have uh, how to make a complaint. So how does that, how does that go exactly? I'll tell you now. So so this is uh, circulated within our media group or within the, the media group. Uh, we encourage people to monitor uh, RTE's content and to complain, print media content as well, complain where possible, uh, promptly, separate print codes for print and broadcasting, similar in tone. Public are entitled to expect fairness, impartiality, and a lack of bias. Uh, so as we know, egregious forms of biased half-truths and mischaracterizations about Palestine on a daily basis. The strongest complaint that one can pinpoint in, in a complaint is a factual inaccuracy which demands the record is set straight. Headlines as well, if they don't accurately reflect. So you make an initial complaint. If the newspaper does not reply adequately, a formal complaint to the press ombudsman can now be made. This is where you do it, presscouncil.ie. Uh, now, uh, so with regard to a broadcast, the main reason for a complaint under a broadcast will be for breaches under Section 48 of the Broadcasting Act. Now, we've done this successfully on a number of occasions. Um, we forced the Irish Times to issue retractions of some of their claims. Broadcasters must provide coverage in news and current affairs that is fair, objective, and impartial. Uh, balance should be achieved with every item. Um, so the first action, complaint in writing to the programme producer, copying lawn manager, reporter, if it refers to a particular report, uh, the RTE's uh, email address and system and so forth. Now, uh, if they fail to adequately address the complaint, Broadcasting Authority Ireland, a complaints procedure can be initiated. Uh, now the tone is formal, but don't bother with that. State your case calmly and logically. And if any personal involvement or upset is involved, this strengthens the case. Now, as a solidarity organization and as people who devote a lot of their energy to activism on behalf of the Palestinian people, that doesn't really qualify us in, in, in their terms. 
no special position of interest in making a complaint. Their NGOs and organizations are not mentioned in the Broadcasting Act. We address our complaints as individuals. Uh, so it's well worth doing. Uh, we'll follow up with guidelines on how to do it. And um, that really concludes my presentation. So thank you very much. And I'm looking forward now to the, uh, to the questions. Okay, thank you, Brian, for that very comprehensive uh, overview of especially the media, how we handle, how we work with the media. And Brian, I think you've been media uh, officer now for a couple of years and working with the team, right? So yep. you, have lot, you have a lot of experience in this area. I mean, that's this is something which I think you, from your presentation, I, I, I guess you're encouraging other people around the country to also get involved in this space, whether it's via their local radio stations, their local press, uh, national press, regional press, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, indeed. I have been asked to repeat my book recommendations. The book recommendations are Ben White, Beginner's Guide to Apartheid, or Apartheid, A Beginner's Guide. Ben White is the author. It's a very slim book. You'll finish it in a number of days. I read it in 2014. It's a toolkit. And by the time a person has read that book, they've gone from the standing start to being a, 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 a certainly a useful activist on the street. Uh, the other one is Ilan Pape, who is um, Israel's one of Israel's foremost uh, historians, and that is Ten Myths About Israel, which does exactly what it says on the tin. So those are my two recommendations, definitely. So what, what I've given you a little insight there into what the IPSC media team do, but also into kind of what you can do. So to get stuck in there, uh, engage with the media, read a lot of stuff, Find we don't like a lot of uh, Irish Times coverage. The point is, find something they're wrong about, define it, pull up a quote from the the NGOs or the human rights organisations, and tell just tell it like it is, finish strong, and that's send it in. You know. Yeah. Okay, Brian. A couple of questions, mainly for yourself. Uh, I noticed that you write your letters to the editor as an individual. Is this related to the complaints procedure? It's not related to the complaints procedure. It, it's really just um, that in, in, in general terms, the Irish Times doesn't have any particular bias in favour of being on behalf of an organisation. Um, that's, uh, you know, they, they're actually more likely to publish something from an ordinary person. We've had less success being published as an organisation than we have being published as just individuals. But uh, there's another factor, which is just... Um, kind of modesty, you know, factuality and 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 modesty and just a de facto scenario whereby I, I basically wasn't writing on behalf of the IPSD initially. And then I was, uh, you get the idea. And then I was kind of writing on behalf of the IPSC. So I just continued to to go under Brian O'Egerta. Okay. Uh, another question there, Brian. Did you observe the discussion last week on Liveline? Uh, I emailed the program to correct some of the content. Uh, but they did not correct a caller who stated conclusively that Israel was not operating an apartheid regime. Yeah, I didn't see prime time last week. I did see the other program uh, news tonight. Yeah, sorry, the uh, live live line. I think it was. Oh, just sorry. Something. Good God, live line. Live line was absolutely appalling. Um, fair play to anyone who phoned in on our side. Uh, it was it was just a morass. I didn't really uh, follow it up in detail. Uh, I do send texts into 51552 or whatever. Um, I suppose that it, technically the RT don't have an obligation to read out every text or don't have an obligation to read out every um, uh, read out every everything. If people are making a formal complaint as such, and then there's also the fact that it's just it's supposed it's it's just like. The, the idea of the program is that it's giving a uh, a voice to your average person, some of whom are wrong about stuff. So that's kind of the idea of the program. So I don't know if it would be grounds for getting a formal complaint off the ground if it was in an RTE news bulletin, which they were portraying as fact, so, such as that Shireen al Akleh was murdered in a gunfight between Palestinian resistance fighters and the Israeli military. Um, then that would be grounds for a complaint if they said it in a news bulletin. 
but that's that prime that sorry that lifeline was an absolute morass and fair play to anyone who managed to listen to it okay some more questions here brian uh obviously a lot of interest in the media which is great uh is there any point in addressing the misnomer israel hamas war which is the title on all rte news big time that's that's enormous uh, if it's almost like almost so so enormous that it's it's difficult to see the wood for the trees one contradiction that i would have to it is that uh hamas is not militarily organized in the west bank but look since the since october the 7th uh israeli forces and illegal settlers have slaughtered no less than 420 palestinians there in a place where hamas isn't even militarily organized there's also another factor which I'd bring into the matter, which is you've got um, Netanyahu uh, in the UN before October held up a map showing Israel in charge of the whole lot. It shows the intentions of the Israeli state. It is difficult to, to conclude on that basis. That's a phrase I love. Instead of stating a fact okay, about Netanyahu, I say it's difficult. it's difficult to avoid the conclusion. It's difficult to avoid the suspicion. And then you can say whatever you like. You see what I mean? Uh, so uh, it looks a lot like that Netanyahu was just after the whole thing. Itamar ben Gavir was after the whole thing. And the Israeli state as a, as a whole really was OK with this illegal settler movement being the jagged edge of a takeover of the entirety of historic Palestine. And that Hamas is really just a, a convenient. This was going to happen sooner or later. And they're just taking the opportunity. OK, Uh Question here. Next question. Uh, just thinking, thinking this could be really useful. Uh, I think specifically again on media for development, education slash teachers for Palestine, critical media literacy applied directly to Palestine, followed by directly taking action by challenging RTE. Right. Yes, for sure. So there's no question that in media literacy, the issue of Palestine is the absolute ground zero. Of, of where you find media bias. There are no better examples of it. That's over the last eight months, and that's over, you know, the last number of decades. Uh, I don't understand, I don't know much about the education side of it and what exactly teachers can do. Obviously, Teachers for Palestine is a brilliant organization. Um, yes, and, and obviously we have Connell next week. So maybe, maybe I, we can keep that question. Uh, I know some of the people involved in Teachers for Palestine uh, have raised that in their WhatsApp group. So I think we, we can carry that over to next week as well. Yes. And I want to mention that we, we have far less leverage with RTE. So like, because the papers uh, publish letters in the papers, we can demand op-eds a person giving their opinion over 850 words. But in the case of RTE, we can only make formal complaints when they do a factual omission, a factual error. Brian, you, meant, you mentioned uh, uh, BAI <clears throat> complaints yeah. or complaints to BAI have, yeah. have any actions or any outcomes positive outcomes ever take uh, happened as a result of these complaints yes exactly uh over the last two years not with regard to RT now in this instance but the Irish Times were forced to publish the following day a retraction of what they had said one of them was about Shireen Abu Akhle. the other I don't remember what it was about but even by making these complaints you are putting a bit of pressure on them. You're making them think twice about saying these things. You're making them think twice about letting Mark Weiss's articles be published without a sub edit on them. Uh, with regard to RTE, I don't quite remember. Um, not, not recently. We haven't had a successful complaint recently, but we did put them under a lot of pressure with regard to, there was one thing, which was at the time of in, in, uh, early mid-February uh, when it, there was uh, so Leo Varadkar had scornfully rejected the idea of Ireland joining the uh, ICJ case and then uh, but by the end of the week he had changed his mind RTE didn't say why but what has happened in the meantime and RTE effectively were invited but they kept this a secret from the public they didn't send any staff to us was in Boswell's hotel there was a press conference featuring uh, people of for profit, featuring Social Democrats, Sinn Féin, every single opposition party, as well as our good friend, Senator Francis Black. And they were saying with one voice, uh, this is apartheid, Ireland has obligations 
and RT didn't mention any of that. That was the news event of the week. So they portrayed Leo Varadkar as changing his mind all on his own out of the goodness of his heart. We know he hasn't a shred of political decency in his political DNA. So that, that's one example. So we put them under pressure just by putting the complaints in. It's not always about a success. It's about an incremental struggle, you know? Yeah. Brian, you've covered this to a certain extent, but there's a question there. Maybe they're looking for some additional uh, input from you. Do you have a language guide for us to use, which I think you effectively have, right? Yes. Um, alternative terms to language commonly used, and I, and I presume you're happy to share this, right? I don't know if we really have it in that format, to be honest. Okay, let me just read the rest of the question so you get the whole thing. Uh, alternative terms to language commonly used that shifts the narrative to one more in line with our position and more likely to prom promote a favourable response from our audience, especially the undecided and not fully on our side. We uh, that's The question is really, do we have such a resource? And frankly, yep. we kind of don't. It wouldn't be any harm if we did. But again... So, so uh, maybe we'll consider... Uh, uh, circulating something in the well, we, we, we'll give an update before the end of these of these five seminars. How about that? Hundred percent. And also, okay. Ben White's Beginner's Guide to Apartheid, the the first book I recommended. Recommended. Um, the end of that <laughs> concludes with a uh, basically a list of Israeli talking points. So and then a response to him, like Israel is looking for peace. Well, part of the illegal settlements, but all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So there, you you are. If you've read that, you are armed with yep. the facts and how to how to get them across. Okay, we've got a suggestion here that maybe we could create pre -pre pre prepared letters and emails for complaints on articles and programs that are diluting the horror of what is actually happening. Maybe store them on our website so people could access and just edit to add the particular program or article they would like to complain about, i.e., LiveLine last week. Absolutely, it's a good idea for sure. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. Would we publish them on our website, though? Would we? I'm not sure. Uh, no, but what we, we could, we could circulate them internally, or maybe to 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 yeah. IPSC groups or other groups that we are working with. Exactly, but if it was if it was one one shocking instance, by you see the 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 thing that would make it difficult is that all the different broadcasts are slightly different terminology. So how can you how can you have one template that addresses it? Yeah, but I I I'm, I I know it's a template. You said. But yeah. what I'm saying is if there was a shocking thing by RT, absolutely deplorable, we could sure. set something up on our website whereby loads of people can just send in the same template and change it a bit if they want. OK, so, yeah. uh, Jerry, sure. Jerry, we've got Brad, we've got input here from all over the country. Uh, uh, every county, I think, is represented tonight. Uh, we've got 165, I think, uh, on, on our call. Uh, so that's. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Derry Branch is planning election hosting for Palestine for the upcoming Westminster election. Would there be any guidance? Maybe no, of... I don't. I don't really know enough to say about that, to be totally honest. OK, I know, I know what we're saying to people here, which is basically if a party did not support the uh, if they're one of the government parties, basically, Fine Gael blocked the Occupied Territories Bill and delayed the illegal Israeli Settlement Divestment Bill. And by the way, they think we've forgotten about it because they they took kind of unilateral action instead of legislation. They uh, they divested money, but said it was due to risk appetite, which could change. So like we're saying, if you didn't support the Occupied Territories Bill, if you blocked the illegal Israeli Settlement Divestment Bill, we're not voting for you, simple as. And yeah. that goes for all the government parties, frankly, because... The green no, no, it's not for me to say what people should say on the doorstep, or it's not for the IPSC to say or something. But that's certainly what I'm saying. You know, Greens, Fianna Fáil, they said they'd back the Occupied Territories Bill. They didn't. They let it drop from the program for government. Fine Gael actively blocked it. Sure. Okay. Uh, very short question. Why I ask, or may I ask, why the news networks are clearly pro-Israeli, the mainstream news networks, I guess. Where to begin? It's such yeah, a, yeah. such a huge question. I yeah. suppose I just I suppose it's because of racism, because of unconscious bias, because of uh, you've got the the geopolitical thing as well, whereby you've got me Western media, and I do genuinely mean Western media, which is led by the two biggies, uh, New York Times and Washington Post, and and filters down from there. They set the the kind of standard much the same as the Irish Times within an Irish context sets the standard. But the Israeli state has been seen 
throughout the Cold War previously to that as like a a, geopl- a, a US asset. Um, Chomsky has written a lot about it in the book Manufacturing Consent. So there's loads of reasons why basically uh, things are very biased and uh, yeah. the Palestinians are feeling the jagged edge of that. And uh, Brian will be on our final session, our fifth session with Zoe Lawler. And uh, there's going to be further further discussion. Obviously, there's a lot of interest in media, so there's going to be further discussion on that. Uh, I wondered if you had thoughts, resources for combating an opinion I hear that a free Palestine is not feasible in practice. I find it hard to articulate for people who are more closed off to radical thoughts like decolonization, decolonization, completely dismantling the Israeli colonial systems. Yeah, I mean, like it, it's fundamentally, it's a fundamentally racist thing, isn't it, to portray uh, Palestine as, as incapable of 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 of, of uh, self government. I mean, a hundred years ago, uh, one hundred twenty years ago, the uh, the crown was portraying the Irish people as incapable of self government, portraying. Kenya, Malaysia, and so on and so forth. It's all Africa. That's colonialism for you. But um, what would I say about there, there's there's a number of aspects. It's very problematic as well that people talk about what should happen after the current carnage ends, and they talk about it in terms of externally imposed solutions. Leo Varadkar did that, absolutely deplorable. And the fact is that that is a denial of. Uh, of, of self-determination of the Palestinian people. What's more, people will make much of this, right? They'll say, look, the, the, Mahmoud Abbas, this is our opponent, will say, Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian Authority haven't held elections for since 2006. That is correct, by the way. Uh, and they refuse to do so. And then how can there be, you know, how can there be a partner for peace to negotiate with or what can we expect from, from Palestine then on, on that basis. The fact of the matter is the Israeli state is blocking elections from taking place in occupied East Jerusalem. So occupied East Jerusalem is treated as a different entity to the occupied West Bank. And generally Palestinians from the occupied West Bank can't even get in ever get into East Jerusalem. But uh, the point is Israel is blocking elections there. And if the Palestinian Authority were to say, look, go ahead, let's have an election across Gaza and the West Bank, they would be acquiescing to the Israeli takeover, the illegal annexation of East Jerusalem. And that's very little, very, very rarely stated, you know. OK, where do you think the Irish media should focus on the issue from a domestic policy or governance perspective? For example, dual use exports, Department of Defense, drone purchases, etc. Though, um, well, the fundamentally, uh, what, if I understand that, like, what would I like to see the media focusing on? Uh, yeah. Well, we would say, uh, you know, we were demanding support the 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 genocide case, and the the government are now kind of saying that they will. Uh, recognizing Palestine wasn't uh, was really just an empty symbolic thing unless it's followed by, and this is the point we're looking for legislation. We're looking for the Occupied Territories Bill, which isn't even a sanction. That is just doing the right thing in relation, ending Ireland's complicity in relation to gross state sanctioned criminality and the illegal Israeli, the, yeah, illegal Israeli settlement divestment bill. And that is just ending the Irish taxpayers' complicity in war crimes. Uh, besides that, we are looking for sanctions because if it was any other part of the world that this was happening in, if this was certainly, if this was Vladimir Putin's Russia that was doing it, or uh, any of the states that are treated as a boogeyman by the West, then certainly there would be sanctions in place. So that's what we should be calling for is sanctions. And of course, uh, you know, going that Irish media should be going to Palestinian sources more and Irish media should be not challenging Israeli narratives. Look at all the things that the Israeli military have lied about over the past while, you know, and, and uh, papers need to to keep that in mind and to treat uh, Israeli military spokespeople with the the skepticism that they that they deserve. Okay, this is the one about. Uh, have we got any advice or tips on where to, where to try and get an open letter published? And the context is, I'm a member of a professional body of mental health care pr- practitioners, 
and they yeah. have yet to issue a statement on Gaza, yet issued one about Ukraine within a few weeks of that starting. I have an open letter drafted on a number of professional signat signatories. Uh, it is long, so would that make it less likely to be published in the Irish Times or whatever? Yes, it's a brilliant question. Firstly, tell me about it. I'm a librarian. The Library Association of Ireland issued a statement in relation to Ukraine, uh, an emergency statement prior to a AGM. They then followed up, and this was in weeks of Vladimir Putin's invasion of uh, Ukraine, which they quite rightly condemned. They have refused to make a statement in relation to uh, to, to Gaza, and the, the word is that the LAI don't make uh, political utterances. Obviously, they do. It took me about 10 seconds to find that out, as any librarian should be able to do. So what I would say, there's two things I want to mention. It's a brilliant question, and I didn't say these. Number one, your word count. Your word count has to be under 200, like if 285 words is ideal. That's long enough to make your point. Any more than that, they probably won't publish it because at the end of the day, the editor has to get on with their job. They have a day's work to do and they don't have time to re-edit your letter so that it's shorter, acceptable word count and also still means the same thing. So 285 words max. Should have said that, didn't say that. The other thing is an open letter per se. Um, they you, you, you can't write a letter, dear Simon Harris, and have that published in the paper. It has to be referring to Simon Harris in the third person. That's just how the papers operate. So I know I don't mean to be pedantic about the open letter thing, but it's like uh, I, I'm just I'm just telling people in advance. It it can't say why do you, the Library Association of Ireland, not take a stand? It's like as librarians and as the profession of media literacy, we are deeply concerned about the uh, LAIs. So we we're saying this is we, but we are referring to the LAI in the third person. The thing about it as well, and absolutely brilliant if people are doing this kind of thing. Um, so you're supposed to send in all th uh, all the signatories to the letter are supposed to be their address is supposed to be there and their um, phone number is supposed to be there. Otherwise, it's not regarded as credible by the the papers. I hope that that answers the question. It's a brilliant question. Feel free to contact me more, media at ipsc.ie. Okay. Brian, can you say something about the role of social media companies and in the broader sense, big tech in censoring or misleading users and in obstructing aid work, for example, a GoFundMe failing to release funds for the Palestinian fundraisers, right? Yes, I don't know enough to comment on that. I know that it happens a lot. It's There's a number of write-ups about it in the media with regard to different uh, social media platforms generally. TikTok is probably the one that is not censoring Palestinians a whole lot because, as I gather, they're based in China and China doesn't have a geopolitical interest in supporting the Israeli state or perpetuating Israeli military propaganda. But besides that, I can't. I don't know enough to say, to be honest. Okay. In terms of the recent famine commemoration, which the Israeli ambassador was invited to attend. Yes. Uh, sorry, which was which was an outrage. The local media has completely ignored the fact she was there. There was no coverage of it. How do you recommend approaching this and highlighting the shocking this shock shocking decision? Uh, letters to the papers is, is how I would do it. What, what about radio, Brian? Local um, radio does it anything? Yeah, if you can, if you if you could chime into radio, if you have your if you have your point together and you're ready to say that on radio, define the problem. Say, good, this is absolutely outrageous, you know, and and ring it to radio and say that most definitely as well. Yeah. What about our position on the IPCC position on the best response to the U.S. government favored to 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 red herring that the two state solution must come about via direct negotiations between both parties, which we well, hear all the time. The first thing is that every uh, Israeli government over the last number of years, be it the the, the um, Yair Lapid's government or or. Uh, Naftali Bennett's government, they have, with increasing scorn, they have rejected the very idea of uh, of, of um, negotiations with the Palestinians. So how on earth is there supposed to be direct negotiations 
when the Israeli government has resolutely refused to do so. And you look at the number of Palestinian legislators that have been locked up by the Israeli state as well. So genuinely, they talk about, you know, the, the Israelis, they like to use the, the narrative, where's the partner for peace on the Palestinian side? But the partner for peace on the Palestinian side, look at, look at Khaled Esherar, uh, they, an elected legislator who was crucial to uh, Palestine's bids to join the ICC, and they've, they've locked her up. You know, they've banned her from, she's never, we've, we'd love to have her as a speaker, she's never been able to leave the West Bank in 25 years, as I understand. So there's two things there. The, the, the Israeli government is locking up the partners for peace rather than talking to them. And number two is the uh, the other thing I said, which I don't quite remember, but I hope you do. Okay, I just want to, it's 10 past, 10 minutes past eight, right? Yeah. Um, some other questions there, but we're probably going to handle them in, in difference, uh, like what 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 actions would we recommend, et cetera, et cetera. We're certainly going to cover that in the last session. Um, how, how do, you know, how, what, again, similar questions to that. Um, so look, I think, I think we, we'll, we'll probably leave it there. We don't want to uh, take too much, too much uh, of your time or, or, or maybe just repeat things that we've either said, answered before, or that we'll be covering in future sessions. So I just want to thank everybody for, uh, for, for, uh, registering, for getting involved. Uh, it's great to see such large numbers. Um, I would encourage you to, Brian, you, you said media, media at ipsc.ie is your email address on the yeah. related thing. If yeah. anyone wants to contact me with regard to media stuff, getting something off the ground, yeah. media at ipsc.ie. Yeah. So. And in, and again, in terms of just the, the, the more general questions in terms of this webinar, in terms of future webinars, in terms of like, we're, as I said, we're going to do these five. But if there's an appetite for people, maybe, for example, there may be a, a more specific one that we might do on media, on BDS, on, on different, on any specific area, or, or maybe uh, uh, in terms of maybe how groups could uh, collaborate or whatever. I just want to put up a poll, actually, a very quick poll. I'm going to launch it there. Hopefully people can see it. It basically says, on this first night, uh, are you involved in a group organization that supports the Palestinian cause? And just... Yeah, yes, no, or if not at the moment, but would like to become more active. Uh, I think you can, let's see. Oh, sorry. I, I have to end the poll before I can publish the results. So if people can get their question or their, their responses in in the next couple of seconds, then I'll just, I'll, I'll be able to display the results to you. So I'm going to. Indeed. Five, I want to four, say. Three, two, one. I'm just going to end it now. Shared results. Okay. Okay. The results are 83% of people are uh, involved, uh, just 2% are not, and 15% would like to be more active. So that's that's very interesting. So, and if you would like to become more active, please contact us and we'll, we'll come back with a response. Absolutely. Okay. So thank you very, very much to everyone for being here this evening. I hope we didn't go on too long. Yeah. Um, I have to say, Conal Duffick is a very, very inspiring speaker. Uh, Walla is an absolute legend. You've, you, you remember her from our demos. Um, John Reynolds certainly knows what he's talking about. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Okay. Thank you very much. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.